Hot diggity sun dog. Diggity. <laughs> <laughs> Hot diggity snowfall out there right now. <laughs> snow again. Must be a, must be a celestial event on the way. Yep. Yes. Yeah, that's that's what's happening. What's going on? Wednesday night, I think, is supposed to give us the biggest amount of snow. Uh, yeah, I think you're probably right. <laughs> More than likely. Okay, well, good evening, everybody, and uh, welcome back to our Sunday night offering of Astronomy Outreach for February the 26th, the Sunday night hey. astronomy show. Har, har. So it's uh, uh, 23 days to spring. It is? It is. Yeah, it is. 24 days, we'll get four feet of flurries. So uh, <laughs> we're at the peak of both Milky Way season and galaxy season. Galaxy season. Galaxy season. Yes. So we'll be getting, so hopefully, if we get clear skies, as I was telling Mike earlier, it's, I, it's been taking me, I don't know, it was two weeks ago that I showed you that picture of the horse head and hydrogen alpha. Still mm. haven't got the data. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well. Yeah. We'll keep trying. Yeah. Okay, uh, my name is Chris Gerwin. I'm the creator and admin of the social media channels known as Astronomy by the Bay. I'm an amateur astronomer and a member of the Royal Astronomical Society of Canada. Yay. <laughs> First of all, I'd like to introduce our two regular co-hosts of the Sunday Night Astronomy Show, Mr. Paul Owen from the Moon Shadow Observatory in beautiful Hampton, New Brunswick. Paul, good evening. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. And our other regular co-host here on the program, Mr. Mike Powell <laughs> from the PFO Observatory here in beautiful St. John. Mike. Good evening. Hey. Hey. Two hands. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, on tonight's episode of the Sunday Night Astronomy Show, our sun, our sun, a four and a half billion year old star, a hot glowing ball of hydrogen and helium at the center of our solar system. Without its energy, life as we know it could not exist here on our home planet. Now our sun goes through an 11 year cycle with the rise and fall of solar activity. We're currently about two years away from the solar maximum best guess anyway, uh, the most intense period of the cycle. What does this represent? How can the cycle affect life here on Earth? And how can we observe its processes? Well, with the cycle winding up and an increased level of sunspots and opportunities for aurora as well, and the coming total solar eclipse of 2024, April the 8th, we thought it might be a good time to revisit what we know about our sun and how to safely observe it. That'll be tonight's discussion. Also tonight, uh, Binal Bud is returning with another fine binocular target of the week. Uh, Paul will be presenting another interesting Rosanna's Fun Facts episode. Uh, I'll have discuss our weekly stargazing targets, which we won't have a chance to see because it's cloudy every night except for tomorrow night. So maybe I'll just talk about tomorrow night. And uh, we'll also have all of your wonderful photo submissions to share. And now this is a family-friendly interactive live broadcast. So for those of you joining us from my YouTube channel or Facebook page, we are happy to try and answer all of your astronomy questions in real time as well. And of course, we'd like to welcome all those who have been joining us through the local Rogers TV network. Thank you for your support. And good evening to my brother, Danny, who watches every day. Hey, Danny. Hey. So let's get started then with tonight's program and uh, look at our sun. Once let's the clouds see. clear, we'll be able to see it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> now, we've got to keep a sunny disposition. Uh, 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 uh. <laughs> oh, wow, wow. Okay. I'd be careful where those sun dogs lift their legs on you. <laughs> <laughs> well, if I'm fast enough, it'll be yellow snow, not me. <laughs> hey, that's where yellow sunsets come from. <laughs> <laughs> sun <Yeah>. dogs. <laughs> oh. Hmm. This is, you want to share? So bring it up there. There you go. There he is. Yep. Go to the slideshow from beginning here and make sure we get the right. Oh, I didn't get to switch screens again. Hang on, stop share. We do share screen one more time. Let's try this one. You got the same one. Same one. Yep. Okay. Yeah, you, you just try to just do your slideshow with it though. Should mm -hmm. be able to. Okay. Well, our son is. Uh, a four and a half billion year old star, a hot glowing ball of hydrogen and helium at the center of our solar system. Um, the sun is about 93 million miles or 150 million kilometers from Earth. This is irritating me. Hang on a minute. I gotta get the right screen. I know I got it. Hang on. And it's gonna be uh, this one, I think. I said number one, this one, there. Let's try this. 
There. There you go. There you go. Hey, okay. Yay. So anyway, the sun is about 93 million miles or 150 million kilometers from Earth, and without its energy, life as we know it could not exist here on our home planet. The sun is the largest object in our solar system. The sun's volume would be 1.3 million Earths to fill it. Its gravity holds the solar system together, keeping everything from uh, the biggest planets to the smallest bits of debris in orbit around it. The hottest part of the sun is its core, where temperatures top 27 million degrees Fahrenheit or 15 million degrees Celsius. The sun's activity from its powerful eruptions to the steady stream of charged particles it sends out influences the nature of space throughout the solar system. <clears throat> Now, one of the sun's biggest mysteries, the sun's outer atmosphere, the corona, gets hotter the farther it stretches from the surface. That doesn't make sense, right? The farther away you get, the hotter it gets. Now, the corona reaches up to three and a half million degrees Fahrenheit or two million degrees Celsius, much, much hotter than the photosphere. The sun rotates on its axis as it revolves around the galaxy. Its spin has a tilt of seven and a quarter degrees with respect to the plane of the planet's orbits. Since the sun is not solid, Different parts of the sun rotate at different rates. At the equator, the sun spins around about once every 25 days, but at, or at its poles, the sun rotates once on its axis every 36 days. The sun is a huge ball of hydrogen and helium held together by its own gravity. And the sun has several regions. The interior regions include the core, the radiative zone, and the convective zone. Moving outward, the visible surface of the photosphere is next then the chromosphere, followed by the transition zone, and then the corona, the sun's expansive outer atmosphere. And the sun goes through a roughly 11 year cycle shown in the following video. So I'm just gonna play this little video here. When we look up at the sun from Earth, it seems calm and unchanging. The truth is quite different. In addition to being abrupt changes in activity, the sun also has a long-term, more regular pattern of change. This pattern is called the sunspot cycle, and a single cycle lasts for about 11 years, although it can be as short as 8 or as long as 14, and it can vary dramatically in intensity. During one cycle, the number of sunspots, a good indicator of solar activity, goes from low to high and back down to low. Solar minimum represents a period of time when sunspot numbers are relatively low, and solar maximum represents a period when sunspot numbers are relatively high. During this cycle, the location of the sunspots also changes. They are at middle latitudes during solar maximum and move closer to the equator as the sun approaches solar minimum. At solar minimum, there are sometimes no sunspots to observe. At solar maximum, there can be many at the same time. The number of sunspots is important because sunspots are the visual markers of where powerful magnetic fields have emerged from the sun's interior. These magnetic fields power solar flares and coronal mass ejections, which can affect Earth and other objects in the solar system. As the sunspots increase, so does the frequency and severity of flares and CMEs. The sun's 11-year cycle is a symptom of a longer 22-year cycle called the solar cycle, or hail cycle, which affects the sun's magnetic fields. Every 11 years, the sun's poles flip. North becomes south and south becomes north. So every 22 years, the poles return to the position where they started the cycle. The flip is due to the complex movement of magnetic fields inside the sun that are constantly stretching, twisting, and crossing as solar material bubbles up from the sun's core. But the exact pattern of movement is not yet mapped out. Because the sunspot cycle follows a similar pattern, regardless of the orientation of the poles, it only takes half as long as the solar cycle. The two cycles are different, but the 11-year sunspot cycle is often referred to as the solar cycle, which can be a little confusing. Right now, the sun is approaching solar maximum, so flares and CMEs are more common than they were a few years ago. Now, this is right now, of course, this is uh, an older video. ...and should reach its minimum around 2020 although predictions about the sun are still uncertain. The slower than expected progress in this sunspot cycle has led some to speculate that the next sunspot cycle might be very minimal. And that's not the case. Sunspots, even at solar maximum, it is still far too early to know. But even if this is the case, it has happened before and isn't something to worry about. It just means that the sun will briefly be a little closer
closer to the onion or it looks like from the ground. So that was the youngest video I could find that could help explain um, solar cycle. Um, and it's actually uh, a few years old because uh, obviously they only get up to uh, 2010 or so there. But the, sun, the uh, solar cycle has actually been quite active uh, this go around. Let's take another look here. So our sun, um, so the, how, do we, how do we know so much about the sun? Well, we study it with spacecraft. NASA and other international space agencies monitor the sun 24 seven with a fleet of spacecraft studying everything from its atmosphere to its surface, and even peering inside the sun using special instruments. The sun exploring spacecraft include the Parker Solar Probe, a solar orbiter, SOHO, ACE, IRIS, WIND, Inode, Solar Dynamics Observatory, and Stereo. Lots of, lots of spacecraft that they're looking at it. Here's an image of uh, taken by SDO, the uh, uh, spacecraft uh, yesterday. So that's our re most recent image of the sun from yesterday. Cool little video. Lots of activity. Still lots yeah. of uh, solar promises happening over here in the edge. And there's a picture of our sunspots as of today. This 3234 is a huge sunspot, uh, many times the size of the Earth. It would take 108 years lined up in a row to cover the, uh, the face of the sun. So that one's probably about uh, 15 or so sizes of the size of the Earth. And it's been releasing some X-class solar flares, which are the, the most strong, the strongest. Uh, here's our current solar cycle. Uh, this is taken, taken from uh, NOAA, which is the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration space weather page. So we can see here that actually the peak is uh, climbing quite a bit higher than what was expected. So we are getting a lot more activity than, uh, than what was expected. Actually, it's almost as high as the last cycle. So uh, we're really hitting into, and we're not even at solar maximum yet. So we're doing uh, pretty well if you like sunspots. Uh, the sun, of course, also causes aurora uh, when space weather activity increases and more frequent and larger storms and substorms occur. The aurora extends uh, equ equ equatorward uh, during large events. The aurora can be observed as far south as U.S., Europe, and Asia. Now, during lar very large events, aurora can be observed even farther from the poles. The more the sun spots, uh, of course, the more solar flare energy is being released into space, which means more aurora activity. Um, during periods of high solar activity, the solar wind is more dense, it travels faster, possesses more energy, reaching the Earth's magnetic field that sets off amazing displays of light by exciting atmospheric gases. In the Northern Hemisphere, the spectacular light shows are called the Aurora Borealis, or Northern Lights. In the Southern Hemisphere, they are called the Aurora Australis, or the Southern Lights. Solar, solar flares have a direct impact on modern society. They create geomagnetic storms that deposit excess energy on power grids and satellite components, causing them to fail. Solar flares disrupt cell phone communications, telephone, television signals from satellites, corrode pipelines, and also disrupt global positioning systems. They also pose a radiation threat to astronauts orbiting space. So it's pretty important that we keep an eye on them and what's happening with them. So there are people who are space weather forecasters. That's all they do. Uh, they predict uh, what's happening with the sun. They watch the sun 24 seven and they predict uh, uh, what's gonna be happening uh, when we're gonna be uh, impacted by uh, a solar flare or the activity from a solar flare, a CME. And they post that information on sites like this, uh, which is a NOAA.gov Space Weather Prediction Center. So you can go in here and click on that at any time and you can get updates. Uh, here's a G1 minor storm, which is something that we don't have to worry about, but uh, they go from one to five as far as uh, strength goes. And there's always uh, new notes up there uh, every, every day. When I'm looking for Aurora and what's gonna be happening, this is the site I go to the most. One of the other sites I visit quite a bit too is uh, spaceweather.com. They have the current conditions of the sun. Uh, there's uh, the sunspot uh, um, image that I showed you just a while back. And anything that's happening with the sun uh, lately is gonna be listed there as well. Ah. One thing that uh, we do realize too is that uh, why the sun and moon appear the same size in the sky. Well, the sun is about 400 times larger than the moon, but it's also about 400 times further from the earth. So they appear the same size when we're looking at them. And what that does, of course, is leads to the point when, this, when the moon can completely uh, block out the sun. And uh, we end up with a couple of, uh, we'll end up with an eclipse. We have two coming up, October the 14th of 2023, which is an annular eclipse, which is, means that the moon is far enough away that it can't block out the complete sun. Then we have one on April 8th, 2024. That's our big one coming right over the Brunswick here. Uh, and that is a total solar eclipse. Here's what's going to be happening with the 2023 one. There comes the sun. 
And that's the path that the sun will take uh, during the eclipse, very narrow path. And the time uh, listed there as well. And we're gonna go ahead to our 2024 April 8th one. This is one we're gonna be watching closely. Right up the coast, uh, about three or so, 3.30, I think on our part of the country where it starts to impact us. So there's the two paths. So that's a little bit about the sun. Well, there, let's shine some light on things. <laughs> oh, 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 arr, arr. <laughs> of course. Oh, okay. So I guess Mr. Powell's next. Oh, oh it's me. It's, it's me, Mom, is it? Okay. It's Mom. Tis you. Tis you. Me, Mom. Let's see if this pops up. Yeah, there it is. Alrighty, so if you do want to look at the sun, like your grandmother said, never look at the sun. You know, when you're kids, that's all you ever hear, right? And when you do ignore them when you're kids, you do look up at it, you learn pretty quick why not to look at the sun with your eyes. But <laughs> if you do want to look at the sun and you have binoculars or a telescope, then there is a safe way of doing it. And one way of doing that, and it's relatively inexpensive, this is only one way of viewing it without looking at H alpha filters and stuff, is to use a white light solar filter. And they're easily and readily available for telescopes. You can buy them from places like Thousand Oaks or Kendrick or Batter. Uh, but I would suggest that you look for a reputable name in solar filters before you just go out and buy one off eBay. Uh, you want a brand name solar filter because it's going to protect your eyes properly. And they're made to go in front of a telescope or they're made to go in front of your binoculars. But white light viewing actually shows you quite a bit. And here it is you can get them for binoculars and i i bought a pair of these ones myself uh batter actually makes a set of eight by 32 white light solar binoculars which are pretty cool but you can use them to safely look at the sun and see sunspots or you can actually go out and buy solar film and make your own <laughs> so it's it's pretty simple if you go to a, a site called uh it's the HTTPS uh, astrosolar.com and then English information and how to. It shows you actually breaks down on how to take some of that solar film that you can buy and turn it into a solar filter for your telescope and or for your binoculars. Of course, the only thing difference in binoculars is you're going to need two solar filters instead of one. So what will you see when you're look, doing white light viewing? You think all I'm going to see is a white ball with some dots on it. Well, that's not necessarily true. And white light... Uh, solar viewing, you're actually going to see, yes, sunspots, and I'll show you how a sunspot breaks down. You're going to see granulations, and I'll show you what granulations look like. You're going to see what's called limb darkening, and you're actually going to see something that, that that's called facula, and it's pretty cool once you start observing the sun that you can see all of these with just a single white light filter. So parts of a sunspot, you've got what's called the umbra, which is the darkest portion of the sunspot, and you're looking actually down into the sun where it's cooler than it is on the outside. And that's called the umbra. The penumbra kind of looks like what I call the waterfall effect. It's the lighter portion around that dark spot. And it almost looks like the outer sun is pouring like a waterfall down into the, the sun spot, like a hole. And then you can see granulations. And what granulations are, if you watch closely enough, it really kind of looks like boiling water on the surface. And it's really cool. You can actually watch that happening in front of your eyes. You can sometimes actually watch sunspots change. They, uh, they can last anywhere from days to minutes. And there's no prediction as to how long they last or, or, uh, or anything like that. So it is cool to watch, especially day by day. Now, facula, you say, what is that? If you look, there are these white lines that come off the sunspots. And this is places where a sunspot could form, but it's almost like eddy currents. I treat it like uh, look, it reminds me of a riptide when you're watching, you know, the bay and you see a riptide. These are kind of like riptides in the sun, as far as I'm concerned. And that's what this facula is. And it's very light compared to the, I know the sun's white and it's light, but you can, these are even lighter when you photograph it. And then limb darkening. And what that is, is because the sun is a sphere and round, it, uh, when, when uh, you look at it, the light is getting dimmer as it's moving away from you on the side. So it actually gives it that 3D effect that makes the sun look like a ball in space rather than just a circle on a piece of paper, like a flat plane. And that's all I wanted to talk about was quickly the, you know, the sunspots and how you can view them and what you will see and when you do. 
And some people like an orange sun. So here's a photo I took on uh, February 29th. Uh, or sorry, February 19th of the orange sun because the 29th doesn't exist. And uh, you can see facula on the sides. You can see sunspots. You can see granulations. You can see that limb darkening. And uh, it really, really makes for good viewing when uh, when you're out there and you have the proper solar filter to do so. And that's all I got to say about that. Awesome. Thanks, Mike. Wow. Good stuff. It's a lot of info. Hmm? Quick and easy. Quick and easy. Eclipse. Watching an eclipse is going to be something different, though. We can do that with a whole different type of setup. Eh? We, can, we don't even have to look at the sun. Broadcast it behind us. Oh, there's a different ways of doing it. That was just white light solar viewing only. Hmm. <laughs> Paul's going to get into uh, another way of uh, capturing the sun with H alpha. Yeah, I got myself back here. <laughs> I knocked the camera over. Okay. There goes your sunny um, disposition. <laughs> I did. You know what? It's uh, rays of goodness. <laughs> so. Boys, all the good jokes tonight, boys. I'm telling Must you, guys. Up up here. Here. Oh, see going here. Oh, you brighten the show. Anyway. <laughs> what, what vitamin do you get from the you sun? I got my life. The song, yeah. What vitamin do you get from the sun? <laughs> Seriously. C. D. There you go. Hi. E. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I'm going to talk about hydrogen alpha. Mike just talked about white light uh, and a little bit about white. You can see with the white light filter. Chris earlier talked on his talk, he had a breakdown of uh, the sun and it showed all the different portions right from the core right on out to the um, to the chromosphere and out to prominences and all those things. So the type of um, images I'm going to, I'll show you the images first and then I'll show you what, how we, you know, what we capture them with. So I'm going to show you, first of all, um, a video. And I just got to get the video running here first, find out where the heck it's going to be on my screen. So I'll know where, what screen to turn on to begin with. There it is. Okay, let me just pause that one. And I'll share my screen. And it's over here. And let me know when you can see that screen. Yes, yes sir. sir. All right, so I'm going to play a video. So what you're looking at here is Chris's um, dichotomy of that um, sun, that, that explanation. What I'm looking at here uh, in a still form are these things that look like gases. And in fact, that's what they are coming off the sun. And these are what they call prominences. And if you look at the sun sideways or, or on the, the, actual, the actual body of itself through one of these scopes, they look like long worms on them on the sun on the sun. And it's exactly the same thing, except you're seeing them face on instead of edge on. And they call those uh, filaments. So I'm going to play for you. Um, this is actual live video of, of uh, this that I took with uh, one of my instruments. So you can see that there's a lot of, on this particular day, and this was a few years ago, uh, of quite a large um, set of provinces right there. So when you're looking at the sun, anywhere around the edge of it, you know, if, if the sun is active, you'll see sometimes only one or sometimes many prominences. And the prominences, of course, are those things. And this one here stretches way up to here. So that's the first one I want to show you. The second one, let me see if I can find it for you, uh, is this one here. This one's a lot more, a much larger prominence. And uh, the reason you're seeing different colors, it was just playing with the white balance when I was imaging it. Um, eventually, I got it into a nice picture. But look at that prominence. That is absolutely incredible. To oh. see, um, and you wouldn't see, you'll see it in the hydrogen alpha telescope, but you won't see it to that degree. You'll just see most of them, you'll see the full disc, and then you'll see the stuff sticking out the sides. Um, but with a certain instrument, you could actually get right into this area. And this is all I could see. I can't see the whole sun disc. I can only see that part of the image. And that again is another very huge prominence. So when you take the videos like that, um you eventually turn them into individual photos i'm going to before i do that i'm going to show you another image that was taken with um <clears throat> a hydrogen alpha instrument but not one that got as close and this is probably some more more along the lines of what you've seen over the last little while and this is taken with a telescope uh again in hydrogen alpha the prominences in this example 
as you can see, are very active, very huge on this portion, but they're all over the limb of the sun. So what that other instrument does, it actually gets me right into these particular specific areas if I want to look at those. Now, the filaments that we talked about earlier, that's what these are. So they're actually just prominences, but because we can see them along the sun surface, sometimes they look like little worms or they've got these long things, but they're actually prominences because we're looking at them straight on. But that's what you'll see through a hydrogen alpha uh, solar scope. Let me just get out of that one and then see if there's something else I want to show you. Yes, there is. Um, I'm going to show you some of the uh, some of the final images that were taken. This was a long time ago and I was just starting out with this stuff, so excuse the crudeness of the image, but um, but there, this, this was just unbelievable to see all of this data that you can catch on these amazing prominences. And, look, and matter, matter of fact, look at that, Mike, that was the, through the core through your 110. Oh, right on. <laughs> That's what oh. he used to get that, that particular image. Wow. And um, another one that I got through uh, there is right here. Again, amazing what you can actually capture and, and you can see what's going on with these uh, images, again, using the, uh, the right equipment. So, so you can see a lot of different um, things with the sun, or on the sun rather. So Mike showed you three or four things that you can see with white light. I just showed you some you can see with hydrogen alpha. And I'm just gonna take a minute to show, I'm gonna stop sharing, and I'm gonna show you the actual instruments that I use to capture that. I'm gonna turn on my light so that my stuff doesn't disappear. You'll be able to see me pretty good now. So the first one is the one that shows all that intricate detail and close-up stuff. It's this device right here. And it's called uh, a cork. And what this one is, this one's, there we go. I'm trying to get it so it doesn't disappear. This one is uh, what they call a prominence model. So its, it's design is, uh, and the, uh, the focus of the bandwidth on this one is for prominences. So when I'm tuning this, with this device right here, um, what I'm trying to do is get those prominences as, as definitive as possible before I go ahead and either view them or image them. You can use this in either a two inch or, whoops, there we go, in a two inch or one and a quarter form. You can use this with any refractor from that is either F4 right up to F9. And if you're going to use anything that's more than 80 millimeters in length, then you have to put on uh, a UVIR filter. It's an energy rejection filter because there's a lot of heat once you get into those longer focal lengths that you don't want to do any damage to your uh, optics. So by using one of these uh, things here, that will take care of that, uh, that issue for you. On the other end of it, of course, you just pull this off and then in goes either your camera or your eyepiece. The reason that you can see it so close is this has a built-in four times telecentric Barlow. So uh, when you pop this into your um, into your uh, diagonal, um, you already have a four um, a four times Barlow built right into this, and that's why we're going so close into specific areas because that's what this is designed for is really close up looks uh, of the sun. Now, how I power that up because this does require power to run. Um, so how I power it up is either with an AC adapter that you can just plug in if you happen to have uh, power to you, or I have this um, solar powered <laughs> charger. Mm. So all you do there is I plug this into the cork and I just, with the Velcro strips, put this on the top of my scope. And if I'm watching the sun, if I'm looking at the sun, it has to be there. So if the sun is there, I'm, I'm capturing power from the sun to actually energize the, uh, the power in the cork so that I'll never run out of power. That's a cool yeah. idea. That's a cool idea right there. Yeah, yeah, it's a very, very cool idea. So it works very, very nicely. Uh, so that's the Quark system. And uh, that's made by a company called Daystar. They make all kinds of different types of um, hydrogen alpha. The second thing I'm going to show you is the, the actual telescope that I use to capture that wider view, field of view. And this is uh, made by a company called Coronado. Let's see if I can get that there so you can see it. There you go. Uh, there. And this is the Solar Max 60. So this one here is a 60 millimeter um, solar scope that is designed specifically for looking at hydrogen alpha band pass. So I'm not going to see some of the stuff Mike will see with his um, white light, 
but I've got everything here that I need to see anything I want in hydrogen alpha. On the top, of course, is my solar scope, so that when I'm trying to aim at the sun, even though we know it's big in the sky, it's hard to find sometimes. So you point this at the scope, there's a little hole in the very beginning there, the sun goes through there, and it comes out the other end in the form of a little white dot that you'll see in the center of this uh, device. And you just center the white dot, and then you know your scope is centered. When you want to look at the at your object to focus it, it's just simply just a matter of loosening this, and you can move this back and forth to get your um, uh, rough focus. Once you've got your rough, rough focus, just tighten that down, and then this button right here, this dial, just spin that, and that'll get you your fine focus, so you can really dial things in. When you want to actually um, look at various parts of the sun, because this one will do both prominences and, uh, and surface detail, chrominance. So you have a slider right here, which basically takes two plates that are inside and just bends them off one side or the other, and it angles the, the, the different uh, bandwidths so that you could actually see uh, either more surface detail or more, or more um, limb detail so you can see the prominences and whatnot. And that's, uh, that's pretty much it. Um, that's made by, again, uh, Coronado. So those are the two types of um, hydrogen alpha instruments that I use to uh, uh, either image or uh, observe the sun. And of course, you saw the results. And that's my story. It's awesome, Paul. Thank yeah. you. Awesome. And if I was a Star Trek fan, I'd say that your cloaking mechanism is working very well in your spaceship there. <laughs> 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 awesome no that's the that's the best ways to uh, that's the ways that we're going to observe the sun safely both of those um uh, eclipse glasses of course are you know another thing that we'll be getting into hopefully in april of 2024 mm -hmm. um, but uh, that's all we're going to talk, talk about the sun just the fact that we you know we're back into our solar cycle now we're heading up to maximum uh we've got a couple of nice years now with sunspots lots of solar flares should be lots of opportunity for our activity of course as it gets brighter out outside uh you know as we get closer to summer we're going to have less of an opportunity to see aurora but um i wouldn't rule it out between now and uh for uh, you know spring for sure there's mm -hmm. still some opportunities coming we're getting some huge sunspots um and some huge uh, solar flares so well, yeah. sun is a very active star and, it is. Uh, we're around, and I mean, if it's if it's this this active during solar eclipse, it's going to be pretty amazing to see a bunch of sunspots as the moon comes in and covers the sun. Should be pretty yeah. amazing. Okay, um, let's go from that then to uh, how about a bino bud next? I know bud. Good. Should be popping up here any second. There he is. Yep. All righty. But I can hear target of the week this week by bino bud is. ME1 and ME2, or as I would like to call it, smidge and smudge. Because <laughs> <laughs> that's what they look like in binoculars. <laughs> so smidge and smudge fit easily into a five degree field of view of binoculars and offer nice uh, offers a nice contrast. ME1 is also known as Bode's Nebula. It's easier uh, the pair to see in small binoculars, but both are easy objects in 10 by 50s with M81 clearly showing a very bright nucleus, and M82 appearing bright but molted along its axis, giving rise to the common name, the Cigar Galaxy. So where do I find it in the sky? Well, I think everyone who is watching knows what the Big Dipper is. It's pretty easy to find the Big Dipper. And you come off, if you take a look at the what would be the cup of the, the Dipper itself, and took the bottom star here and the top star in the corner, and do a line straight through, it'll take you straight to M81 and M82. Here's another view of it. If you look, go out around midnight and look virtually straight up, this is what you're going to see. And then you point north because it's right above your head, almost directly straight up. And it looks like this. You'll see the Big Dipper. Take these two stars in the cup, draw a line straight through them, and go the same distance, and it'll put you right on M81 and M82. You can't miss it, really. So what to look for? Hopefully, this is something like what you're going to see. You'll see, uh, you know, the cigar galaxy, and you'll see the nice spiral galaxy, the two of them together. In 10 by 50 binoculars, yes, it's a little smaller, but they you can pick them off. They're easy to see. There's M81 there and M82 there. If I compare them to the full moon, 
it's going to be at least the distance between the two of them is a full moon distance. So it's not difficult to spot. If you get in the right place and you're looking across, you will see them and you'll know it when you're on them. And there's an astronomy challenge for you. <laughs> Things in the object may be smaller than they appear. <laughs> <laughs> and that's binocular target of the week by by no bud. Awesome. Thanks, Mike. <laughs> okay, just needed a couple of seconds here to get things organized. Okay. Another great talk, another great uh, vinyl bud, and we're going to move on to our Rosanna talk from there. All right, so let's check here and just put these things away. Okay, let me get the, let me just get that set up. Just take me a second here. Mm -hmm. uh, Rosanna, Rosanna. We're alone. Okay. All right, and let me put this up there. And then let me share my screen. Perhaps, perhaps not. There we go. And share. And this is this week's. Rosanna's Fun Fact. Hey, welcome back, Rosanna, for another timely fun fact from our great friend in the province of New Brunswick, Miss. Rosanna. So, Rosanna writes, hi, Paul. What a great week it was for beautiful views of the moon with Jupiter and Venus. I think everybody would agree to that. Every one of my students went home with one extra thing on their assignment list. Be sure to look up in the night sky uh, each night this week. I'm keeping my fingers crossed for clear skies for March the 1st. Fabulous sky sites are a great cure for weather blahs, or winter blahs rather, even if the sites arrive via the internet while you're toasty warm inside with a cup of cocoa perhaps, slightly enhanced with an additional warming liquid of some kind. <laughs> <laughs> this week I'll start with an image of the Mercury transiting in front of the sun uh, from back in January. Whoops, sorry, that's me. Get rid of that. That's one sec here. Sorry about that. Just bear with me one sec. Uh, where did that go? Uh oh, yikes. I don't know where. Oh, there she is. I don't know how we'll get out there. Let's try to make that work. There we go. So there. So this week, I'll start with an image of Mercury transiting in front of the sun. Uh, from back in January. In a quick glance, you would almost think Mercury was just another sunspot. But actually, there it sits, right there. Wow. So, pop quiz. From looking at this picture, how many Mercuries would fit inside the sun? Do, 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 do. Well, it could be bigger than one and a half million. <laughs> going to say. Uh, Anybody want to guess million. out there? Without checking uh, the internet, anybody want to guess? Uh, I'll say 2 million. I'm saying 15. Okay, Mike, you're considerably closer. Really? 21.2 million. Really? Wow. 21.2 million Mercuries will fit in the sun. Give or take one or two. Give or take one or two. <laughs> <laughs> so here's a, here's also a th uh, just a, a three second uh, of a wow from a video from a solar observer. Let me just get it over here. I'll put I'll put it up over here so you guys can see that. Oh wow. You're right. <laughs> there it is. That's cool. That's Mercury transiting. And that's captured by a solar uh, um who's the cop by the solar that's orbit, cool. one of the solar orbiters. Very, very cool. So the past week also saw various provinces celebrating Family Day. In the U.S., it was President's Day. Surprisingly, at least to me, hair samples from George Washington, Dwight Eisenhower, John F. Kennedy, and Ronald Reagan are all scheduled to head to space on May the 4th of this year. So May the 4th be with you on the uh, United Launch Alliance's Vulcan rocket. There is also another DNA uh, and cremated remains of at least 183 
human souls from astronauts to Star Trek celebrities. And I guess DeForest Kelly must be one of them. Wow. To scores of Cel Cel Celestes clients that will be going along. The bidding to catch a ride of uh, for your deceased loved one into outer space ended in October. The pricing ranges from 3000 for a quick rise and return to Earth or to the starting price tag of 12,995 US dollars for a launch deep into space. The pricing was lower than I expected considering the cost of funerals today. <laughs> so I guess yeah. that makes sense. Alan Boyle, the uh, author of February 20th article on the upcoming May launch of the aptly named Enterprise flight, uh, jokingly stated, it turns out that a, uh, that a future uh, extraterrestrial invasion force is headed by a clone of George Washington. We'll have only uh, ourselves to blame. <laughs> and although Mr. Boyle was joking, he did point out that if we think spacefarers will be able to figure out how to play a golden phonograph uh, record, maybe it's not such a stretch to imagine that they can produce a carbon copy of George Washington. <laughs> <laughs> The Vulcan's main job will be to deliver the astrobotic uh, peregrine lander, a cute little smoker barbecue looking thing, to the surface of the moon with two dozen science experiments and other payloads. The upper stage will orbit around the sun carrying the remains into deep space where at some point the Enterprise flight will become an Enterprise station. The Vulcan Enterprise flight will also launch the first prototype satellites for Amazon's Project Kuiper or Kuiper, however you want to pronounce it, broadband internet network. If you didn't think there were enough satellites in our night sky already, get ready for this. The Federal Communications um, Communi Commission says Amazon's 3,236 satellite Project Kuiper constellation is fully cleared for deployment, deployment after the company filed an acceptable plan for dealing with the risks of orbitable, orbitable debris. Half the satellites would be launched in 2026. Now I'm gonna make this bigger so y'all can see it. I couldn't find out what constitutes acceptable debris <laughs> and every householder probably has some different idea. Anything from this to this. <laughs> <laughs> but there are lots of pictures out there that might define it for space. I don't feel at all bad about the state of my bedroom closet now. Look, that's what they're, that's what they're <laughs> expecting to see. And I, that's not, I don't think that's a stretch. Wow. So anyway, let me get my mouse working again. There we go. And we're worried about balloons. And we're worried about balloons. <laughs> so. Raise your altered cocoa into cheers to the night sky this week, and who knows what you might see. Look, it's a new constellation. No, it's just Amazon. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and that is this week's, if I can get it to work. There it is. Uh... This week's. <laughs> Rosetta's Fun Fact. Yay! That was an absolutely cool fact, and there, I had no idea. I mean, we see a lot of stuff, and actually, I got a, a message earlier for someone who wants uh, one of my images with all the satellites that were going through what we talked about in my, on the, the horse that I was taking, and just to, I guess, talk about that. But that's just minimal compared to, and you guys saw it. I don't think I, I don't know if I showed it or not, but anyway. Um, that's just minimal compared to what's happening. I mean, another 3,600 of them from these guys and whoever else is putting them out. I oh, mean, space you know what I mean, like, thank goodness for the software we have uh, for us imagers because we can get rid of them. But the people who are actually studying space, I, I really feel sorry for them. Yeah. It's really getting to be a mess. For those that are looking for exoplanets, I mean, they look for an exoplanet and they try to see, you know, the light from a from a distant star and a planet pass in front of it and they get a little bit of you know dimness like that happening yeah they wouldn't know if it's a planet or if it's a satellite passing in front unless they knew exactly what was happening or when how quickly it was happening or 
Yeah, well, that's it. Those people there, uh, radio astronomers are having a real trouble with it because of the, all the frequencies right there. Having real you know something? No, it's our own fault because everybody wants internet and, and phone. <laughs> right? yeah. We can't live without them. So if there wasn't a market, they wouldn't be putting it up there. Yeah, it's, uh, it's a shame that uh, we have to destroy so much to have so much. Yeah, that's that's man, isn't it? Because I think that's you know that's just that's by nature. That's what we do. Yeah, uh, yeah, we're willing to give up um, sometimes the most important things to get some things that aren't so important. So right. Yeah. I mean, I see these these large telescopes going in now, like these huge ones that are coming in uh, down on Mauna Kea and stuff, and they're uh, around Mauna Kea, and uh, they're not even online yet, but they're going to have to deal with thousands more satellites when they uh, when they come online. Yeah. Yeah. Scary thing for sure. Anyway, Thank you, Rosanna, for another great talk. Yes, fantastic as usual. Absolutely. Okay, let's go from there to a quick what's up then, and then we're going to do some photos and then close out. So let's get my second what's up talk here. What's up? Let's see if I can get the right screen this time. Select the right screen first of all. Okay, let's go back. Try this one. No, I go to. Uh, we'll see where it goes. <laughs> Hang on. We still got to get some music for these in between slots. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm gonna, yeah, I'm gonna bring my guitar in here and I'll just play some stuff. Both. There we go. Yeah. yeah. No, we haven't get the slideshow. That do we got it on the wrong screen again? Yeah. Here it is. <laughs> play that guy. Over time. Over time. Dun dun ding 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 ding. <laughs> this one, I think. There, better. There you go. There you go. Uh, all right. What's up this week? Well, that's what's up this week. That's the main target, anyway. Um, the conjunction of Jupiter and Venus. I'm just going to play this little video here. It's going to play in the background while I'm talking about it. I think. I think it's going to play. Here it is. Okay. Uh, well, perhaps the biggest show of the year. Well, not the biggest show, I guess, because we do have a, sol uh, a solar eclipse coming up in October for some people. Uh, it is occurring right now, though, and it's up to the main event on Wednesday, the conjunction of Jupiter and Venus. Now, many of, of us have been watching their celestial dance for a couple of weeks now, and they will be, will be about the width of the full moon apart in our sky on Wednesday. Now, the good thing about this show is that it's not over in one night. The display will continue until about mid-March or later as the two planets switch positions, as they're doing right there. Of course, the sky is getting brighter in the background there as we get into March. That's a good thing, I guess, for some. But anyway, that's what's happening uh, coming up. Um, the, this will be their positions in our sky relative to each other on a cloudy Wednesday evening coming. Uh, they will also appear very close on Tuesday as well as Thursday evening. It should be a fantastic view. Now, if you choose to check them out with binoculars or a small telescope, they will easily fit together in the same field of view of binoculars. So they're only half of a degree apart. Most binoculars give you about a seven degree field of view. So you should be able to get two, uh, two planets together uh, in the same field of view. It's been fun to see a lot of uh, images that have been shared with me over the last while. Men Monday uh, the 27th is the first quarter moon coming up. Um, on the 27th, also, we have the moon near Mars. Uh, on Monday evening, look for our first quarter moon as it greets reddish Mars and Taurus. Now, Mars and our moon will be a little over one degree or two widths of the full moon apart. Also much dimmer now than late last year. Mars will remain in our sky until about July. Uh, on Tuesday night, lunar straight wall. Now, Lupus recta, also known as a straight wall, is the most curious linear feature, roughly on a vertical center line on the moon's face, about one third of the way up from the southern pole. It is easily seen with a small telescope when the lighting is just right. And here, lighting is very important indeed. When the sun is at the right angle, the straight wall becomes quite obvious. One day after the first quarter moon, the rising sun makes it uh, cast a dark shadow to the west, giving the impression it must be a massive high cliff. As the moon reaches its last quarter phase, though, the sunlight illuminates the other side, the straight wall, uh, causing it to appear bright. Now, the reason for this difference in appearance is that the straight wall isn't a wall or cliff at all. It's just a slope, 110 kilometers long and about three to four kilometers wide. One of those optical illusions on the moon. Uh, on Thursday, the moon is near Pollux. Uh, 
look for our waxing gibbous moon as it greets a giant star Pollux in the constellation of Gemini. Now, Pollux and Castor shine brightly in Gemini. Pollux is slightly brighter and is the 18th brightest star in the sky. It's relatively close at only 34 light years away. Pollux is just under two times the mass of our sun, but it's about nine times its diameter. Uh, from there, I'm going to go to Lisa's Look Up, Astronomy More. Lisa puts out this uh, great chart every month. This is her month of February, getting close to the end of it though now. We're getting down to the first quarter moon phase that we were talking about in our uh, Jupiter-Venus conjunction. So you can find uh, Lisa at Ruby Moonbeams on Instagram, Twitter, Mastodon, and Facebook. And today she shared with me her brand new one. So this oh, is her uh, chart for March. Nice green there for St. Patty's Day. I like that, yeah. Yeah. And green for spring. So she lists again, all the events are listed here on the left-hand side. Her dates are here when you're going to see that event. The peak times listed here. And then the seeing tools. Do you need naked eye, binoculars, or a telescope? You can find her chart at Lisa's Look Up and More, Astronomy and More, at Ruby Moonbeams on Instagram, Twitter, Mastodon, and Facebook. And our St. John uh, Astronomy Club calendar. This is a, a calendar that Kurt Mason puts together for us every month uh, for our, our St. John Club and for Rask NB. You can go to sjastronomy.ca and download that calendar. That one takes you right up to the 18th of March. So any celestial events that are happening are all listed there. A little bit of space news this week. Your ice cracks explained. Well, scientists on Earth have discovered two new types of solid crystals that form when table salt and water mix in cold temperatures at low pressures. The discovery could explain the strange red streaks that crisscross the surface of Jupiter's moon Europa. These scratch-like lines have a chemical signature that doesn't match anything found on Earth, but scientists think it could be a frozen mix of salts and water. The new discovery could finally provide an explanation as to what these streaks are. Of all the Galilean moons of Jupiter, Europa is probably the most mysterious, and since it is believed that under all that ice is a global-sized ocean, it may be one of the best prospects for finding some type of life elsewhere in our solar system. Scientists find a meteorite in Texas from a fireball that exploded with the force of eight tons of TNT. This is from space.com. Scientists have found a meteorite from about 450 kilogram space rock that exploded over Texas with the force of eight tons of TNT this month. At any given moment, the earth is being bombarded by pieces of organic space debris known as meteoroids. Now, fortunately, most meteoroids are tiny with a typical size ranging from a grain of sand and a pebble and they do not uh, typically pose any threat to the planet or life on it. But on February 15th, a much larger meteoroid slammed into Earth's atmosphere and fragments of it rained down across Texas. NASA's Johnson Space Center confirmed the event in a statement which noted that the meteoroid likely measured about a half a meter across and weighed about 450 kilograms when it entered the atmosphere. And it was traveling at about 43,000 kilometers per hour and exploded with the force of eight tons of TNT about 34 kilometers above Texas. NASA notes that once they're on the ground, meteorites cool quickly and generally don't pose a risk to humans. And finally, uh, NASA's space launch, uh, SpaceX Crew-6 go for launch. The launch readiness review for NASA's SpaceX Crew-6 mission to the International Space Station is complete and the mission has been given a go for launch. The liftoff is targeted for 2.45 a.m. Atlantic time, Monday. Uh, from Kennedy Space Center Launch Complex 39A in Florida. SpaceX's Dragon spacecraft Endeavor, powered by the company's Falcon 9 rocket, will carry NASA's astronauts Stephen Bauer, Warren Woody Holberg, uh, United Arab Emirates, Emirates uh, astronaut Sultan Anayadi, and Roscosmos co uh, cosmonaut Andy Fedeyev. On a 25-hour trip to the space station, the crew will dock at approximately 3.38 Atlantic time on Tuesday, February 28th, remaining on board the microgravity laboratory for up to six months to conduct science and maintenance. And uh, how one of Saturn's moons ejects particles from oceans beneath its surface. Enceladus, the sixth largest of Saturn's moons, is known for spraying out tiny icy silica particles, so many of them that particles are a key component of the second outermost ring around Saturn. They form, they actually uh, add to the rings of Saturn. Scientists have known, not known how this happens or how long the process takes. A study now shows that tidal heating in Enceladus's core creates currents that transport the silica, which is likely released by deep sea hydrothermal vents over the course of just a few months. Now our research shows that these flows are strong enough to pick uh, up materials from the seafloor and bring them to the ice shell that separates the ocean from the vacuum of space, says Ashley Schoenfield, a UCLA doctoral science in planetary science. 
Enceladus' active geology is fueled by tidal forces as it orbits Saturn. The moon is tugged and squished by gravity. That deformation creates friction in both the moon's ice shell and its deep rocky core. The new model demonstrated that the friction heats the bottom of the ocean enough to create a current that transports the silica particles towards the surface. Pretty interesting stuff there with, uh, with what's going on with Enceladus in Europa, I think. And that's our talk for this week on what's up and a little bit of space news. <laughs> run. <laughs> run, run, run. Okay. All right. Um, quick photos, then, I guess. Hey, next. I think we have a few photos here to share. I just got to find them. Talk amongst yourselves. Not over here. <laughs> yeah. Ah. <laughs> okay. I'm hearing voices. <laughs> okay. We got. All right. Let's go start with this one here from Bridget. Photos. Oh, oh I'm not sharing it, am I? I'm going to share the screen. Here we got. Right here. There, I was I was muted anyway. What's up here? I see planets. No, nope. we do. Well, we shouldn't be seeing that one. Hang on. I see your main try screen. Let's try this one. Let's try this one. Hang on. Big. Planet number nine. There, how's that? Oh. Closing number nine. <laughs> no, nope. we'll stop again. Goodness gracious. Great balls of fire. Hang on a minute. Golly, Miss Molly, as it were. Hang on a minute. Great balls of fire. That's the sun. That's what we were talking about all night. <laughs> <laughs> Wait a more bread. Put it on the right screen here. I think it it'll is. be extra. No more bread. <laughs> um, share screen again, and we're going to go to this one here. There's a conjunction. Is that showing it? Yeah. yeah. No, is it showing us too? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Hang on. <clears throat> This one. Oh, that one. There it is again. Still showing us? It's a it's a what, are we doing, what are we doing here tonight? Huh? It's a conjunction from Bridget. I know it's a conjunction, but. Yeah, just you in the corner. Share uh, screen one. Just you in the spotlight. There we go. Okay, here we go. <laughs> here we are. Goodness. All right. Uh, well, Bridget Green. Uh, she said she was listening to my CBC segment and she sent, uh, she went outside to take a, a photo with the phone. Um, her husband couldn't, uh, husband usually can't point out what I can in the sky. He was actually impressed with the view, she says. So that was our conjunction, of course. Um, Ooh, a lot of views of that. Right just snapped a picture with her phone and sent it. Yeah, that's cool. <laughs> button that I had to hit, Brad told me to hit last week. Was it F9? Something on the keyboard anyway. Arr! There's a comment. Anyway, there's a comment from uh, David Smart. Oh, right on. Very um, nice. Uh, C22, very hard to see. He said comment was taken with Canon T3i DSLR. Uh, uh, exposure 20 seconds at f5.6. It was about a magnitude 8.1. So, yeah, it's getting pretty tough to see. Yeah. Let's capture the moon. There it is. Well, nice one, David. I can't remember what button that was supposed to, was supposed to hit last time around. And uh, we got another one here of this moon capture. And yes, is capture of the conjunction as well. Here it is. That's mine, was it? That's Venus and Jupiter, I'm assuming. Yes. Yeah. Yes, Venus and Jupiter. We thought Jupiter was so bright all winter long, and then Venus shows up, right? Oh, it shows right. much yeah. dimmer Jupiter is. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I'm um, going to take us through a few shots here. Bill Leonard got this one here, sent this into us. Uh, Bill says, uh, taken from North uh, Edmonton, Alberta, uh, using my iPhone 8. So another shot of the moon, Venus, and Jupiter together. Uh, Brad Perry sent this one. That's really oh, nice. nice. Yeah. yeah. Says, Hi, shot. Chris. Uh, though I know you've got no shortage of captures this week of the wonderful crescent moon and planets display we were treated to this week. Here are a few more. Uh, two of the images are of the moon just as it was setting over downtown Fredericton on the nights of Tuesday the 21st 
and Wednesday the 22nd. That's gorgeous. Yeah, it's a beautiful shot. Shot, and we're just 22nd shot. Oh, wow. Yeah. Yes, sir. Nice. Yeah, yeah, both of them are stunners. Very nice. Love the effect of the clouds, too. Like, yeah. 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 Does some great work. Um, the other images of the complete moon and Jupiter and uh, Venus yeah. together. Yeah, that's nice reflection. Nice on shine. Yeah. yeah. 40 minutes prior to the 22nd, or prior, uh, four minutes prior on, this, on the 22nd, also from Brett I like the reflection on the water that it casts. Yeah. yeah. Great shots. Even at that phase, he's got a lot of brightness on the water. Yeah. I uh, got this one from uh, Matthew Dupre. It's a couple of submissions from this week. There's one of his shots with the moon and Jupiter and Venus together. Nice. Yes, sir. Another with uh, some sun dogs. Well, doggy. Yes, sir. <laughs> okay. And then. Nice uh, shot. Yeah. You know what? And the, what's cool about that, besides the sun dogs, you got the sun, the dog trail tails on both of the dogs. Yeah. And then you got. Um, um, the halo. Uh, high and low pillars on off the yeah. sun. Mm, yeah, that's a really really nice capture. There's a lot of full circle. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. On top of all that, uh, Winston Coke sent this one in. Uh, Winston, the only moon picture he said this week. Oh no, I'm sorry. That's not that's not his. That's uh, let me see what happened this week. There it is. Oh nice. Yeah, that almost straight line. Nice. Look at that. Yeah, look at that. Straight up. Hang on, I get them mixed up here a bit. What happened was it, it combined two folders for me tonight <laughs> before the show. I think that's his Winston's photo. Okay. Yes. Yeah, nice earth, earth yeah. shine. Yeah, very that's, nice. Yeah. That was, you know, I mean, the pictures show some yeah. nice things, but to actually, when you see that naked eye, yeah, that's oh, a, it's just. It's just surreal. It really is. It is. This one was from Dwayne Schmom. Uh, Dwayne says that the moon, Jupiter, and Venus conjunction is seen from a cruise ship near the Yucatan Peninsula. Wow. wow. That's why it's a straight line. <laughs> yeah, well, look at the shine on the moon, right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. yeah it's on, it's upside down there. Yeah. She's upside downy. Uh, Who's not, upside down? <laughs> that's in particular about the photo, but it does offer a different perspective from this latitude about 20 degrees north. Yes, sir. <clears> it does. It's beautiful. That's cool. Yeah. I'm um, just looking at the pictures as I go through and so make sure I get the right name. So that was Winston's and this boom here was from uh, Marie Jean LaBelle. And Marie, uh, these are just some of the captures that were sent into my page. Yeah, right on. From uh, oh. Tara Hart. Tara Hart is in Brown's Flat. So Look at the stars, getting, guys, eh? Hmm, mm. Just getting some different views here. This one is from... Uh, Jeremy Costain, Jeremy uh, from Hillsboro. And I'm going to move to this one from uh, Donna Briggs. And Donna sends this one from Uptown St. John. Oh, nice. Yeah, nice. really nice. Building. Uh, going from there to this one from um, Annette Smith Wright from Saratoga County, New York. Yes, sir. Just a sliver of the moon in there. Mm. Yeah. Surya, and then the next one is from Shannon Lee from Campobello. There you go. Oh, that's nice, right over the water, eh? Yeah, the pretty sunset. Yeah. Next up is Connie Harris from Heartland. Very nice, Connie. And uh, there are over two hundred sent to my page, but I'm picking out a few from different locations. That's all. Um, yeah. Denise Denise Gauthier from Moncton. It's interesting to see the different, um, um, how close they are to the horizon. Yeah. yeah. You're taking it at different times, right? This one from, uh, this one is from Jeff Dalton and Jeff uh, took this from Canning, Nova Scotia. That's Very really nice. nice. Amazing shot. sky too, hey? Yeah. Mm. That's really nice, yeah, it's a nice touch. That would mess up your green filter. <laughs> <laughs> Lisa Fanning. Lisa sent this one in. Uh, from Joyzy. From Keyport, New Joyzy. Yes, yes sir. sir. Where's the snow? <laughs> <laughs> I think they're fortunate enough not to have that, eh? I think yeah. so. Uh, this one's from uh, Cindy Gallant and uh, Cindy Gallant McKillop from KO Coco Cuba. Wow. Oh, wow. So you can see how they're kind of lined up differently as well, right? Yeah. Yeah, well, I'm looking at the. Uh, the crescent on the moon. Yeah, it's a Get an idea what angle. Smiley face. That they're viewing, yeah, that they're viewing it from. 
quite nice. Nice. And then uh, we're going to go from there to this one from, this is from Carrie Underhill. Carrie got this oh, one nice, from Sanford, Sanford, Florida. Beautiful. Yeah. Oh, beautiful yeah. skies, eh? Yeah. yeah. And Scott Young uh, got, uh, is out in Winnipeg, got this one. Very nice. Winnipeg. Wow, it's cold out there. Mm. Yeah. That's yeah, it's a clear sky, though. Year, right? <laughs> yeah. And Margaret Wells from Newfoundland. So this one in. Right oh, on. nice. Awesome. Okay. And if you'd like to send your photos in, we love getting them, as we have shown before. Send them into astronomybythebay at gmail.com. And we'd be happy to share them on our next broadcast. Yes, indeed. Okay. Get that window. Back at this window. Okay. All right. Um, I think I got to go back to six or eight screens. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, um, so in closing tonight, tonight, you know something, pretty soon we're going to be talking about galaxy season. So maybe we'll we'll get into that kind of a talk over the next couple of weeks because we are in the galaxy yeah, season. Yeah, well, that and Milky Way because they're both coming up. So now's the time. Uh, I see some people out getting Milky Way shots already. So so we may, we may discuss that next week. We'll, we'll, we'll let you know. Yeah. Uh, so closing in tonight, thanks again for all your support out there. Our special thanks, of course, as, as always, to Rosanna for continued contributions to our program. Rosanna, thank you very much. We'll be the same without you. Uh, we, we do appreciate it. We also hope that those of you who have joined us from Rogers enjoyed the program tonight. If you would like more information on the wonders of the night sky, you can find me at astronomybythebay.ca. Uh, remember, too, we do love getting your photos, so send them into uh, astronomybythebay at gmail.com, and we'll be happy to include them on our next broadcast. And please let your friends and family know, too, that we will be back here next Sunday night at 8 p.m. on YouTube and Facebook to entertain you on astronomy and the wonders of the night sky. So for now, then, from Mike, Paul, and myself, wish you all a safe week. Lots of clear skies, everybody. And as we like to say, open your eyes to view the skies and keep your scopes. Good night, everyone. Mm -hmm.